Everybody have a good Lord's Day so far? Amen. Amen to that. Uh, let's see here. What day of the week is it? Sunday? You don't know? Huh? Save that when everybody's in a bad mood. Then we'll need it. All right? Yay! Amen. Amen. God's good all the time. Amen. And all the time, God is good. Why won't my phone? There it will. There it goes. This is my new iPad. I opted for the mini version of it. Uh, Deuteronomy 32. Revelation 12, we'll go ahead and turn there, <clears throat> and um, appreciate everybody being here tonight, it's been a good day, amen, um, we'll, um, we'll be posting uh, later this week the various videos, pictures, and so on. You should, have, you should have seen Sweetie Pie uh, Thursday out at Kilimambogo. It is a, um, it's a village uh, about two hours out of Nairobi. And Kilima means mountain or hill. Mbogo. I don't, I don't know why these Africans like to put M in front of their words. Like, Mbogo and Ngali or whatever. But Mbogo means buffalo. So it's Hill of the Buffalo. Or in English we would just say, yeah, it's over there on Buffalo Hill over there. Uh, big, big hill out in the middle of this plain. And they almost get no rain, but they have this, uh, what started out as a beautiful spring-fed river, uh, but for the trash collected in it, it would be a pretty, pretty stream. But that's about the only water they get in this area, and they get their drinking water and their livestock water and their, their pasture water from the same place. Uh, but the people there, uh, I, and, and as strong as Bible Christianity is in this village, I don't know where they got the people to build a mosque but there's a mosque uh, right at the entrance to this village. And what, what always was curious to me about it was, even in Kenya, they build buildings to line up with the streets. Okay, But this building isn't lined up with any street, and it's right next to a street. We would use the term cattywampus. It's, it's not juxtaposed correctly to the street. So I was out there looking at it one day, a couple years ago when we were there, and you're on the equator. When you're in Kenya, you're almost right on the equator, so north, south, and east, and west is pretty easy to figure out. And there are 12 hours in a day, every day out there. 12 hours and 12 hours. And it's pretty easy to figure out. But I was looking at this building. It's got four towers on it, four minarets. And it's perfectly lined up with the four directions, north, south, east, and west. Now, they have to do this. They have to do this. Because Allah doesn't like things not lined up, apparently, or whatever. Um, but they do it because Mecca is east. And they call them, they say they're not idol worshipers, but they are. Because, let me explain idol worship. Idol worship and, and geomancy are pretty much the same idea. It's the idea that something on this earth requires your obedience or your uh, reverence. And if you don't give it, the reverence, then you're not going to paradise. And um, this particular mosque 
and it was like this anywhere you go I would say in Kenya I don't know about the rest of the world but every mosque I've seen in Kenya is always lined up north south east west and um, the four towers the four minarets this is what's interesting in elemental witchcraft you have the four elements earth air fire and water but one of the band members left, so now it's just earth, wind, and fire. But So anyway, um, the four elements, according to Wicca, have uh, spirits that are associated with them. And these spirits are dragons. Figure that out. And they're called watchtower spirits. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. It's where they get their name from. But anyway, there's these dragons that are asleep and they're over these four towers, these four uh, elements. And in order to invoke them for your magic ritual, you don't dare wake them up quickly or they'll eat you. That's the idea. That's, that's, their, that's their religion. And they say, well, what makes their religion any worse than yours? Um, ours is real. Um, there's nothing on this earth that you need for eternal life. Not a building, not a direction, not four magic words, not four sacred stones, nothing. There is Christ everlasting eternal offering for sin, his atonement and his blood on the mercy seat of God where God is sitting right now. There's your salvation. It's not on anything of this world. You don't have to get saved in this church. You don't have to get saved facing this direction or standing in this spot on the carpet. Not, we don't require anything on this earth because if man can build something that requires you obeisance to it for salvation, some other man can destroy it. Why we didn't blow up Mecca after 9-11 should have done it because that would show these people that their religion is in vain. May have just made them mad, but anyway, um, that, but that just, that always bothers me because I know what kind of spirit is associated with those moths. Because I've butted heads with those spirits before. Uh, out in Megory, Kenya. And uh, I don't want a mosque in Jefferson County. That doesn't make me a racist, doesn't make me uh hateful i i don't want that i love people and i feel sorry for these muslim women who have to endure the hatred of islam towards women and it's a religion that says to you men if you encounter a non-muslim woman you can rape her on the spot and Allah says that's okay because she's a dog. And that comes from a religion who chained 72 women to a couch with perpetual virginity so you can rape them for all of eternity in paradise. It's paradise for you, but what about the women? And I just don't, I don't get that. I don't understand why you would want that for your eternal life when God's version of it is so much better. It doesn't require molestation. Amen? And uh, I just, I, it, I, I, would, I would match Bible Christianity up with any religion in the world and say, this is better because. Okay? I believe in the gospel. I believe God makes men free. God is a clean God and God sets man and woman free alike. In, Christ, in Islam, there's a difference between male and female. In Christ, there is no difference. Male and female both are heirs to the kingdom of God. Amen. All right, Deuteronomy 32. And then we'll look at some other places here in a little bit. It's good to have you with us today. Good to have everybody with us online. Those of you joining us uh, in places in Kenya, we welcome you to Bethel Church. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for guiding us and for... Uh, giving us the taste of the gospel. Father, I, I stand beside this book and reverence it and believe what it says and teaches what it says. And Father, this, 
this way that you have given us is right and it's holy and it's good. Father, you've given us the Ten Commandments. And in those commandments are our love for you and our love to our neighbor. And you tell us not to break these commandments to our God nor to our neighbor because we're doing ill to both. And Father, every religion on earth seems to be full of pride and full of contempt for people where your true religion shows men to love other men, even men that are not of the same faith, not of the same race, not of the same country, not of the same uh, financial class. God, you teach us to love from the greatest even to the least. And Jesus taught us that when we do good things unto the least of your disciples, we've done them unto you. And Father, we thank you for that and for what it means. Because it doesn't demand that we honor those who seem to be greatest among us. Father, it calls upon us to honor those who seem to be least among us. And to wash one another's feet, even as you washed our feet. And to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. And Father, we thank you for that golden rule. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the way that you're teaching us to live. And Father, we're not easy to teach. So everything that you accomplish in our life, Lord, is a great thing. And we ask you, God, that you would enlighten our minds and our hearts. And teach us, dear God, that there is a war going on. And it's not a war against people, it's a war against spirits. And Father, teach us the right way and teach us how to discern the spirits and to put them to test. And give us understanding from your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Deuteronomy 32, we have been uh, teaching on what are devils. What are, what are devils? We have, there is one devil called the devil in the scriptures. And that is uh, in Revelation 12. We can actually see, uh, let's see, that would be verse 9, Revelation 12. The, Drake, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, that goes back to Genesis 3, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So where there is the devil, uh, at, and the Bible identifies him as Satan, the serpent, the dragon, uh, Lucifer, in Isaiah 14, 12, how thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, Lucifer means light bearer. And Ezekiel uh, 28 gives us the job description of Lucifer before his fall, it gives us his physical description. He was full of of precious stones. He was covered with precious stones. Uh, he was adorned with musical instruments, tabrets and pipes. And he was the most amazing, the most beautiful angel in all of God's creation. But then iniquity was found in him. And that iniquity was pride. He was thinking that he was the creator and forgot that he was the creation. And so he set about to be like the Most High, Isaiah 14, 14 tells us. So we have the devil, we have Satan, uh, who is the great deceiver. And then we mentioned this in Sunday school, that there, are, there is a hierarchy of angels, both good and bad. There is, on the good side, there are archangels. Um, literally meaning that they are the highest of all angels. Michael is an archangel, Gabriel. And then you have who the Bible describes Lucifer as the anointed cherub that covereth. So there's this idea, may not be, we may not be understanding this 100% correctly, but this idea that Lucifer's wings were spread over the Ark of the Covenant because we know that God describes himself as dwelling between the cherubim. And the Ark of the Covenant, it was specifically designed by God telling Moses, God showed Moses what it was. 
And then he told him that, you know, I want you to put two cherubs on there with their wings spreading over and covering the Ark of the Covenant to cover or to hide the glory of God. And so there's this idea that at one time Lucifer had that position, exalted position of being the one who covered the throne of God. Um, and I, and to this, I'll add the sin of covetousness. We covet what we see. And so I think Lucifer's looking at that throne and saying, that could be my throne. If I could just kill that guy on the throne, then I could have the throne. If I could kill the son, then I could have the throne. He's the heir of all things. So if I kill the heir, then I can have it. That's his, that's his thinking. That's the way Jesus described it in the parable that he taught. And uh, so anyway, that's the devil. But then we have his underlings. We have angels that are subservient to him, that he commands them what to do, they do it. But we also know that God can command these evil angels to do something and they'll do it. And they'll do it simply because God designed them this way. Um, you don't have to force a dog to chase after a stick. Okay, you don't have to make him do it. All you got to do is throw the stick and he'll go grab it. That's in his nature. And we see in the story of Ahab where God is wanting Ahab to be provoked to go to war the next day. Ahab, if Ahab finds out that he's going to lose the war, he may not want to go out. So God says, I need somebody to lie to Ahab. And this angel said, I know how to do it. And God said, how? And he said, I'll go be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. And God said, go do it. And so this spirit then, an evil angel, went and was a, a, in the mouth of the prophets unto Ahab. And they all, they all agreed and said, oh, Ahab, God has shown us you are going to get the victory tomorrow. Hallelujah. And they all said the same thing. And Ahab said, well, I'm fine with that. And you got to remember, in the back of Ahab's mind is what Elijah told him. Ahab, in the place where you had Naboth hung for not giving you his vineyard, the dogs are going to lick your blood. And Ahab is avoiding any possibility of anything cutting him. He's probably letting his beard grow. I'm not going to let blood come out of me because I don't want the dogs to lick it up. He's avoiding this. But God sets him up to be deceived and Ahab fell the next day. So, I mean, we get, we're getting from scripture, from these stories, we're getting how the spiritual realm works. How these devils do the things that it is they do. So, Deuteronomy 32, verse 17. The Bible says they sacrificed unto devils, not to God. I made the comment about Devils will always require you to kill either yourself or somebody else. God did not ask, us, ask that of any of us. He sent himself, Christ, who was sacrificed for us. It's not, we don't sacrifice for God and get that accepted. God only accepts the sacrifices of his only begotten son. And so think about the religions then that require you to kill your firstborn child. That's nuts. Okay, that's crazy. But it's, it's religions throughout the centuries and throughout the world requiring human sacrifices. Whether it's your firstborn or whether it's slaves that you conquer in battle, those gods require a human sacrifice. God does not accept that. God only accepted the voluntary sacrifice of His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. And so they sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. So that is the basis then of our understanding of what devils are. They are gods with a little g. Did we have a prayer yet? I couldn't remember. It's been so long ago. Sometimes my mind just comes and goes. You know how that is. Amen. All right. Uh, let's go to, let's see, where can we pick this up at? Evil angels. And let's see here. Yeah, let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2. 
2 Peter chapter 2, it's been a couple weeks, so I'm not quite remembering where we left off, but we'll cover some ground and then we'll move forward. 2 Peter chapter 2, the Bible's going to describe for us a certain group of angels that sinned. This group of angels that sinned are not the devils that we see uh, in the Gospels. They're not the devils that represent the gods that people worship. They're not the devils that inhabited uh, certain people like Legion and so on. These are, a, these are a different group of angels. And we'll see what their sin was and what God did with them. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, and we're going to learn from the Bible what that sin was. But cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And then the book of Jude. There's only one chapter in Jude. So if I told you to turn to Jude 2, you fell for it. Jude verse 6 is a double witness, a second witness to Second Peter 2. The angels which kept not their first estate. What was their first estate? Their first estate was heaven. That's where God made them to inhabit. They inhabited a realm above ours. The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. There it is. They had a dwelling place that was above ours. And there was something that lured them out of heaven. And caused them to commit a sin. The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. Now, the reason why I'm, I'm sort of partitioning this out or sequestering this part of scripture. Is there are some people who don't believe what the Bible says in Genesis 6. So they'll want to say... That all of the evil angels, the one third that is cast out with Satan in Revelation 12. Right now, those angels, those devils are in chains in hell. Does anybody believe that? I don't. Because I fought them. They don't act like they're all that chained up to me. If you've ever tangled uh, or in, if you've ever encountered these evil angels, these devils. And, and had to battle them and had to, uh, had to wrestle against them. You would believe that they're chained up. Um, but some, because they don't like the interpretation of Genesis 6 and what it means, then the only sin they can come up with is rebellion with Satan in the war and they're kicked out of heaven and we're, by, we're, we're battling chained up angels. Again, if you've ever battled them, you know they're not chained up. Uh, it's the same, sort of along the same crowd that says that Jesus is not going to reign a literal 1,000 years. He's going to reign. The word, the phrase 1,000 in ancient Greek sim, uh, symbolized a large amount of time. But we're not just dealing with ancient Greek literature. We're dealing with the word of God. And if God said a thousand years, he did not mean something besides 1,000 years. To that, they add, we believe that Satan is bound right now. I don't believe that. Because that's the idea. If we're in the millennial reign of Christ right now, and Satan is bound, then who's doing all his bad work? If this is an idea of how bound Satan is, I'd hate to see him loose because he's doing a, I'm going to say a really bad job at what he's doing, meaning he's doing a good job of doing bad things. So I do not believe that Satan is bound and in the bottomless pit right now, nor do I believe that Christ is truly reigning over the hearts of men right now. That sort of delegitimizes the kingdom of Christ where he's going to, he's going to come and literally reign over mankind for what there's not going to be a, a president or a king or a governor, there's going to be a king of kings and a lord of lords, and the earth is going to be ruled by him, and he's going to do it better than any politician or any king ever. Best one ever. So, what is the sin 
Jude 1, 6, 2 Peter 2, 4. What is the sin that these angels, what caused them to leave their first estate? What caused them to leave the habitation of heaven to come down here that God was so bad that God threw them into hell, wrapped them up in chains and kept them there? What was that sin? Turn to Genesis 6. Here is that sin. Genesis 6. Verse 1, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. Verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days. How about you believe in that one? Say amen. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bear children to them. So the Bible's telling you, in verse 4, it's telling you that it happened twice. Happened once before the flood. There were giants in the earth in those days. And then also after that, meaning after the flood, they did it again. Um, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, that they bear children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And I, I would just encourage you if you would just want to have fun on the internet uh to look up ancient myths and ancient stories about giants because it's not just myth the bible's telling you that these stories the same became men of renown the mesoamericans south americans european Russian, China, Africa, um, Middle Asia, like in India, and every place on the planet that tells stories from long ago, they all tell dragon stories, and they all tell flood stories, and they all tell giant stories. And all three of those stories have a basis in reality in the Bible. Now, you're not going to get the whole truth out of these stories, but you're going to, what you're going to hear is giants. That's the part you can believe because um, they dealt with them before the flood. We know after the flood that Moses killed two of them, killed two of their kings, Og and, um, who was the other one? Og, king of Bashan and Sion. And then Joshua killed 31 more. David killed Goliath and David's mighty men killed four other giants that seemed to be related to Goliath. In fact, we know they were related to Goliath. And we're not just talking about six foot eight guys. We're talking about uh, Og's bed was nine cubits tall. That's 13 and a half feet. That's the bed that he slept on. Goliath was somewhere close to around 10 feet tall. It's not unbelievable when you understand where they came from who was their who was their sire where did these giants just did they just magically appear or what well it's telling you that the sons of god saw the daughters of men so along with these giant stories all over the world you have stories of gods mingling with human women greek mythology roman mythology uh, Chinese mythology. In fact, the Chinese creation story is basically about uh, a god and a goddess mingling their seed together to create men. But you have these giant stories. The first civilization on record was the Sumerian civilization. The first civilization to ever begin write stuff down was the Sumerians. And they all wrote about the giants and how they got here. Okay, first newspapers basically were the Sumerian records of history. And they recorded from their viewpoint how this happened. And they all said it was the gods and human women and that they made giants and so on. So let's go to, uh, let's go to Daniel. No, Job. Job chapter 1. Who are the sons of God? I'm, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I have a lot of teaching on it, but just to cover the base here, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. 
And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. If we went down to verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. The sons of God here are the angels. If we look in Job chapter 2. Verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also before the Lord. Again, the sons of God are the angels. If we turn our Bibles to uh, Job 38. You have, as far as the phrase sons of God are concerned, you have the Genesis 6 reference. You have Job chapter 1, Job chapter 2, and Job chapter 38. And as far as the Old Testament is concerned, that's, the, that's it mentioning sons of God. So Job 38 tells you in no uncertain terms who they were. Job 38 says, verse 6, Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The morning stars, these were angels. The sons of God shouted for joy. These were angels. Is it possible that something like this could have happened? Well, we know Jesus, as you turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians 15, we know Jesus, um, they asked him, a, they gave him a situation, they said in the law, if a man married a woman and the man died before they raised up seed, then the law said that his brother had to marry her. And if he died before, they, I mean, they come up with this ridiculous scenario. And all of a sudden, this guy's got six brothers and all of them die. I would hate to be brother number seven. And they said, it's your turn. I ain't marrying that black widow. No, I'm not marrying her. I'll die. Because every one of them died before this guy. But the scenario was, a man... The law said that if a man died before he raised up seed, that his brother had to take her to his wife to raise up seed unto him. And they ran through, what if brother number two died, brother number three, brother number four, five, six, and seven, brother number seven died. All seven of this man's brothers died. Whose wife is she going to be? And it's like, you know, where did Adam get his belly button kind of stuff? And Jesus said, you do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. See, that's your, and Jesus said, that's your problem. Your problem is not me. Your problem is you don't believe the Bible. And he said, you don't know this, but in the resurrection, we neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels in heaven. There's a lot packed in there. But what he just said was, God doesn't allow angels in heaven to get married. There is, there is none of that. But notice he said, in heaven. During homecoming, I was telling you I read commentaries from like 150 years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. I'm not the first guy to come up with that statement. I, there's common, common commentators from 100 years ago saw in what Jesus said, angels in heaven. And they went, there it is right there. If you're an angel in heaven, you don't get married. That's the rules. These left their habitation. Okay? They committed that sin, leaving their habitation. They left their estate and committed a sin. The uh, book of Job says God charges angels with folly. And so some would say, therefore, they can't get married. So they didn't get married. But 1 Corinthians 15. The, the other objection to that is angels don't have bodies. They don't have DNA. 1 Corinthians 15 covers both of those questions. Verse 37, 1 Corinthians 15. That which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. He's talking about seed. It may chance of wheat or some other grain. And what is in a seed but a bundle of DNA that's going to determine what that plant's going to be. So verse 38. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him. And here it is to every seed his own body. If you see it growing out of the ground... It came from seed. If you see it walking around on two legs or four legs or eight legs, it came from seed. Or if you see it flying around with wings, it came from seed. So, in verse 40, there are also celestial bodies. What does celestial mean? Celestial is where we get the word ceiling. Where's your ceiling? 
It's up there. The heavens. Uh, the Spanish word for heavens is celesto or something like that, but it's ceiling. So celestial beings are the beings that are in the heavens. There are celestial bodies. There it is. And bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. Um, there is one glory of the sun, one glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. And uh, then, he, then he gets into the transition to teach about the resurrection and the rapture, the translation. But he says there are celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. They are two different types. But a, it's a body nonetheless. And since it's a body, it comes from seed. The seed is the word of God. God spoke us into existence. And in thus speaking, he wrote the book of our DNA. As with every living creature on the earth, as with every living creature in the heavens, God created them with his word. He spoke them, he spoke their bodies into existence. And that body comes from seed. So, there's a mingling of the seed taking place in Genesis 6 and then after the flood. And this really does, uh, I think, I think it bears great weight in understanding devils because and who these devils are because it's going to happen again in the form of Daniel chapter 2 in the fourth kingdom they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men the Bible says who is it that's doing that it is whatever that fourth kingdom represents and I believe that it represents evil angels. God's going to turn them, give them rule over this earth. The gods are going to rule, all right? The gods are going to rule. So, uh, now that we've cleared that out of the way, let's go to Revelation 12. Let's look at uh, what, what these devils really are. Revelation 12. Let's read this. We're going to read this whole passage here. I have verses 3 and 4 up on the screen, but Revelation chapter 12. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. She being with child cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. So you remember 1 Thessalonians 5. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. Revelation 12 is part of that. But so is Isaiah 13. If you want to write that down, Isaiah 13 talks about the sun being dark and the moon turned to blood. And pangs are going to be taking over men as the pangs of a woman in, who is travailing in birth. You see it in 1 Samuel 5, no, 1 Samuel 4 with the birthing of a child whose name means the glory has departed, Ichabod. The birth of Ichabod has his mother dying in childbirth and his mother pain to be delivered. She's in her travail. She's travailing with child. And remember, this child is the offspring of uh, Phineas, who was Eli's son, who was a very evil man. He was, a high, he, was a, one, he was the high priest's son, and he lived a life of, I take what I want. That's the kind of person he was. If he saw a woman walking by, he grabbed her. And he could get away with this stuff because his dad's the high priest. Okay? And when it came to people bringing offerings, he just grabbed, the law prescribed what the Levite priest could have out of all the offerings. God made it no uncertain terms what they could and could not have. Well, Phineas would just take a flesh hook and dip it in the pot where they had put in the various parts of the sacrifices and drew out what he wanted. And it got to be such a problem, people stopped giving. They stopped bringing their sacrifices to the temple because they said, God's never going to see it anyway. Phineas or Hophni is going to take it. So what good am I doing bringing a sacrifice if it's not ever going to see the light of day inside the tabernacle or in the temple. So they, they just quit doing it. And to be honest with you, churches have shot themselves on the foot when it comes to people giving. 
Because so many churches have done it wrong, have stolen money, misused money, uh, run off with money or whatever. So many churches and pastors have done this, have done people wrong that people just don't want to give anymore. And it's, it's hurt everything. Uh, so, the, I mean, that Bible's right. But anyway, uh, that's what you think. You look for things in the Bible where a woman is travailing in birth. Because it all has meaning concerning the last days. So, verse 2 again. She being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Uh, John 16 applies here too. There, there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Hold your place right there in Revelation 12. Notice that the dragon has seven heads. What could those seven heads be? Turn to Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy 7. The land flowing with milk and honey in the story of Moses is a foreshadowing of heaven. You and I seek a country that is given to us by inheritance. It's given to us because we are sons of God. In the New Testament, every place where the phrase sons of God is used, it applies to us as born-again believers. Because we're going to take their place. God's going to kick out one-third of the angels in heaven. That's going to leave plenty of room for us. We get to move into their mansion. And if you study the Exodus, that's exactly what God promised the Israelites. He said, when I send you into this land, you need to understand me. You're not going to have to go in and, and build houses. I'm going to run the people out whose houses you're going to live in. Their coffee cup's going to still be sitting with hot coffee on the table when you move in. I will have just chased them out. And you'd be going, oh, I like this house here. This is nice. Okay. Oh, look, dinner's on the table for us, huh? Come on. I mean, literally, that's what God said. God said, I'm going to run them out. I'm going to give you their house. I'm going to give you their cities. I'm going to give you their cattle. I'm going to give you their fields, their vineyards. I'm going to give you everything. That's what's waiting for us in heaven. We're going to get to inherit a land that doesn't belong to us, but by God's promise, by inheritance. We, the sons of God, get to inherit the kingdom of heaven, and we're going to move in a mansion that some poor, dirty angel was living in. So, in Deuteronomy 7, look at verse 1. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before the thing about what he just said, cast out. That's the exact words used in Revelation 12, cast out. So he said, hath cast out many nations before thee. How many nations? The Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and Jebusites. How many is that? You don't have to count. It says right there, seven nations greater than... I'm not kidding you. When I first read this, I'm going, oh, I'm going to count those. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven here. And then I read seven nations and I'm going, oh, I didn't have to read it. <laughs> seven nations greater and mightier than thou. Here's the dragon with seven heads. They, you could say they represent these seven nations. A head is usually a head of a nation. It's the the boss, like the head of the body is Christ. But, as we said this morning in Sunday school, this kingdom is divided against itself. If anytime you've got seven people running a company, you don't have seven people running a company very well. There cannot be seven bosses. Have you ever, have you ever had this happen? One boss says, I want this done this way. And another boss walks up and sees you doing it and is going, what are you doing that for? Well, boss number one said to do it this way. Boss number one's an idiot. I said do it this way. I'm fixing to have me a talk with boss number one. I'll tell you that right now. And you're going, when you guys figure out where your head needs to be, come see me and tell me what to do. Right? 
there are not seven pastors to a church, seven husbands to a wife, ladies. Oh, listen to the collective sigh. Oh, thank God for that. <laughs> anyway, the se <laughs> seven heads would be bad, wouldn't it? Amen. Uh, back in Revelation 12, the dragon has seven heads. In verse 4, his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. There they are. That third part of the stars, they're already evil. It's not that they're really good angels, but then they decided to follow the rebel without a cause, okay? They were, they were evil from the creation. Um, and, and the story of Ahab shows you that. Because when God said, who'll go and lie to Ahab... It wasn't just one angel that said, I know how to do it. There was one and then another. I mean, God, there was hands raised all over heaven. I know how to do it. And God picked one and said, go do it. So these angels are evil from the beginning. God, we covered that two Sunday nights ago. God created evil. Uh, Isaiah, I put that up on the screen. Isaiah, let's see, where is it? Where did I put it up on the screen at? Uh, Genesis 2, ah, come on, I know I, I know I did. Isaiah 40, there it is. Isaiah 45, 7, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. If it's a, if it exists, God created it both good and bad, but it serves his kingdom. It serves his will. Um, it was the eve, think about it, it was the evil of this world that drove you to the cross, right? Because you said, I see where I'm going and I don't want to go there. Excuse me, when you drive by the cross, let me out because that's where I'm staying, I'm getting out of here. And you got out, let out at the cross and you've been there ever since. So in that sense, God supplying enough evil in this world is what caused you to choose him. If you don't have evil, you don't have real choice. It's not a real choice. If McDonald's offers you hamburger A or hamburger B, and there's no difference between the hamburgers, you don't have a choice. What's the difference between hamburger B and hamburger A? Well, there is no difference. Well, then I don't have a choice. Sure you do, A or B, which is it? Well, is there any way you make B other than A? No, they're all made exactly the same then you don't have a choice. But God made a really good burger and a really awesome burger. And the awesome burger is the evil one, right? Because sin always feels, tastes, smells good. It always temporarily is good until it's over with. And then you're going, this is not what I thought it would be. Amen? So, anyway, back to Revelation 12, verse 4. His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. I uh, asked Pastor Lord Sunrock from India. I had a theory. And I said, Pastor, is it true that uh, those who worship the various religious practices in India, like the, who worship Shiva... Shiva is just one God among many in India. And I said, is it true that the Indians worship 33 million gods? And he said, yeah. That's, he said, it's ridiculous, isn't it? I said, I have a theory on that. One third as the percentage is 33. And I think the 33 million, in fact, I know, the 33 million gods that are worshipped in India are these one third of the angels. They worship evil angels. Now, compare them to the other angels that you see in the Bible. One in particular that visits John, and John bows to this angel, and the angel says, Stand up, for I am as one of the, I'm, I'm as, the, as you are. In other words, don't worship me. I'm just an angel. I'm just a messenger just like you are. The good angels never 
receive worship from men. The bad ones demand it. They command men's worship. They command men's obedience and reverence and so on. And when these devils don't get their way, they are very mean and they're very evil. And they don't treat the people that worship them very good at all. Make one mistake in a ritual and your family's going to starve for a year. That's how good those, those devils are. Okay? Don't say the magic words right in a spell and you'll see devils. That's what I was telling you about the four minarets and the four watchtower dragons of, of Wicca or Islam is that the Wiccans are told that when you're going to when you're going to bring in a um, an elemental spirit to do your magic spell for you be sure that you wake them up gently because if you wake them up instantly they are very mean and they could kill you just for waking them up i had a friend in in college Craig Shaw, Craig was deaf in one ear. And he always slept on that ear. So when I had to wake him up for us to get ready for class, he would always be laying and I'd say, Craig, and he wouldn't hear me because he's deaf in this ear and he was always sleep on his good ear. And I learned one time, I went up to him and I, now Craig was a ranked high school wrestler, fifth in the nation. This guy had meat on his bones, Ron, and I'm a little skinny, drawn-up guy. I woke him up one time, just shook him like that. He jumped out of bed. Whoa! So I knew better than that. But that's the way these dragons are. They, the witch's book that I read said, if you wake them up, they'll be angry with you, and they might eat you and kill you. Um, that's not Jesus. That's not God. These angels are are evil in their nature and they do not have a problem destroying the very people that worship them okay and I've mentioned communist nations like Russia and China Cuba Venezuela these communist dictatorships don't see anything wrong with killing massacring millions of their own people for the sake of the state what time is it Oh my, see, I don't have my watch. Anyway, let's get back to this and I'll finish it up here. Um, the tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, did cast them to the earth, and dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for a devoured child as soon as it was born. She brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up into God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness where she had the place prepared of God where they should feed her there a thousand two hundred three score days. And then verse 7, verse 8, verse 9, there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels. That's the one third and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. There's your devils right there. Now, heaven is not the only place that they were allowed to dwell in. We know that they had access to the earth. But at this time, they also had access to heaven. But at this particular point, God dismisses them from heaven. They are no longer allowed access to heaven whatsoever. Satan's cast out, the angels are cast out with him, and as, it, as of this point, they're not allowed to go back. And God has a purpose in that, because God is then going to destroy all of these angels that he cast out of heaven, and he is, he's going to give us their place in heaven. All right? Uh, all right, let's stand to our feet. Are we done? We done! Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day you've given us. 
Lord, I already see them trees out there starting to turn just a little red, just a little yellow. And Lord, you're about ready to set ablaze every tree in the state of Missouri. What a beautiful time that is. We thank you, Lord, for changing the seasons. We thank you, Lord, for those seasons in general because it helps us understand that our life goes through changes. It goes through cycles. And uh, Father, we thank you for the word that was given to us today. We thank you, Lord, for the work that you have blessed this church with. We ask for your help always in doing it. Help us, dear God, every time we come together, that we be mindful, Lord, of the many people uh, that are watching us online, uh, the many more people that are listening to us uh, over the airwaves in Kenya. Help us, dear God, to be um, one as, as people. Help us, dear God, to um, be a blessing to those people around the world as they are to us. And Father, just help us always to be mindful, Lord, of the great work that you've given us and the great responsibility that goes with that work. And Father, our enemies are real. They are principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. And Lord, there's a lot more wrestling to be done before we leave out of here. But you promised us, Lord, to always giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe somebody here, maybe somebody watching today, Lord, is battling some of those devils today. I pray, dear God, that you would reassure them that victory is always there. You always cause us to triumph. Father, thank you for that reassurance. Thank you, Lord, for your help that you give us every day. We thank you for the Bible. We love you. Lord, just grant us a good week. Bring us back this Wednesday for Bible study time. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.